whole issues of how banks are supervised across the Eurozone, issues are going to have to be worked through. Then there's the issue of economic underperformance, a challenge for the EU. The EU has not performed well enough economically. It's not just since the global financial crisis. If you go back to the 1980s, the Euro area wasn't performing well enough. And I've got my views about uh, the policy positions, many policy positions the EU, EU chooses to adopt are not conducive to high economic growth. Forgive me, but uh, I've been around politics a long time, the economics of politics, and where governments control large chunks of the economy, you will not get high economic growth. Simply won't happen unless you've got extraordinary set of circumstances in developed countries. I mean, in countries like China, sure, where the, uh, the government may control a large hunk of the economy, its development is much easier because you're starting from a much lower base. But in developed countries, uh, I think they've got some real problems there. And then you've got the lack of economic uh, agility, political and economic agility in the EU. Its institutions are cumbersome. It's so difficult to change anything in the EU, EU. And what might have made sense in 1982 when the Maastricht Treaty was signed uh, isn't going to work that well today. Yet it's so difficult to make change there. And add to that the impact of the fact that the EU is a customs union. It might be a common market, but it's a customs union. And with wisdom of hindsight, New Zealand and Australia were so smart when we developed our common market, CER, we didn't make it a customs union. And that's been hugely positive for New Zealand and Australia because it's kept a, a competitive dynamic between us that New Zealand was able to negotiate a free trade agreement with China when Australia couldn't. They negotiated a free trade agreement with the US and we couldn't. And we've had to work out how do we make up for that? How do, the, how do we cope with the fact they've been able to get that advantage? It's kept us uh, working competitively and that's so important in terms of economic progress and economic uh, dynamism. And uh, in Europe, you don't have that because it's a customs union. No one can do anything outside the customs union. The UK, for example, couldn't negotiate a trade agreement with anyone. The EU had to do it. And that, in my view, has been quite a negative in terms of economic growth within Europe. There are examples of, of that lack of agility. New Zealand's wanted to negotiate a free trade agreement with the EU for years because we were one of just six countries in the world that had no free trade agreement with the EU. The, others, the other five were Russia, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Australia. Why would New Zealand be uh, you know, left out in the dark so much? So we've been trying to negotiate one. But first we had to negotiate a partnership agreement on relationships, I think it is on relationships and uh, what on earth is it called? On relations and cooperation. We had to spend two years negotiating a partnership on agreement on relations and cooperation before we could start uh, down the path towards a free trade agreement. Why? Because uh, apparently the EU wants to satisfy itself that our human rights systems and our, uh, our, uh, those sort of uh, systems in New Zealand are all good enough. When I had that delegation that was mentioned in my introduction in, uh, in, in Brussels in 2012, we were, we were talking about this very issue, and a Green member of that delegation, who are, to whom human rights are a pretty, pretty important part of the Green uh, you know, cause, if you like. This young uh, member of parliament looked at the EU people explaining all this to us and said, do you seriously think New Zealand's human rights track record isn't as good as your own? You know, this, uh, a Green member of parliament was highly offended that the EU thought it had to go through this whole rigmarole because New Zealand's human rights track record mightn't be as good as theirs. Our standards might not be as high as theirs. But still, that's what they do. And so we had to go through that rigmarole before we could even start down the path towards a free trade agreement. And that sort of thing in this modern day and age is not, not good enough. The world moves faster today. You can't muck around like that in this day and age. Singapore has negotiated a free trade agreement with the EU. But it can't come into effect because it had to it ended up in front of the European Court of Justice trying to sort out whether the European Commission had the competence to negotiate all parts of this free trade agreement. And the European Court of Justice, I think, has ruled that it didn't have the competence to negotiate the, some of the investment aspects of that free trade agreement. So now it has to be agreed to by all 38 national and regional parliaments of uh, the EU, including the fairly well-known regional parliament in Wallonia that held up the Canadian free trade agreement. And this kind of cumbersome lack of agility is just going to be a mill wheel around the EU's neck 
as it seeks to make progress in today's modern world. So let me move on. Let me, given those challenges, what in my view drove Brexit? And uh, I'd say the answer is some of those challenges were involved, but very much different things uh, to different people. Because I was there in the UK prior, you know, the lead up to the Brexit uh, vote, I, I you know, watched the whole thing with great interest. I think for some people, undoubtedly, there was a redneck reaction to immigration flows. To, to some more thinking people who are concerned about that, was more a, a concern about the UK's lack of ability to have its own immigration policy. They had no control over the... The only way they could have any control over immigration policy was to stop people coming from places like New Zealand because they couldn't control uh, any flow out of any of the 27 other European EU member countries, so they had to focus their immigration policy on places like New Zealand, Australia, United States, Canada, and a lot of people in the UK thought, does this make a lot of sense, those who thought more than just beyond the redneck reaction to immigration. Then I think you had some people who uh, uh, were thinking uh, a little more were troubled a bit by the fact that the UK, uh, they, they perceived the UK was too dominated by laws out of Brussels, laws and regulations out of Brussels. Rightly or wrongly, they perceived that, that too much of the UK's law and regulation was coming out of Brussels. And one does have to accept that European law and regulation, their, their legal institutions and judicial systems in Europe are different from those in the UK. And what's more, you've got a, a totally different sort of cultural background. The UK, some people in the UK felt we've had democracy evolve here over hundreds of years, going back to Magna Carta in 1215. And, and it did evolve over hundreds of years. Whereas in Europe, in the, most of the EU, democracy is a very recent thing. It's really only post Second World War for many, many members of the EU. And to have these you know, members of the EU for whom democracy and some of these institutional arrangements have been such a recent thing, telling us in the UK where this stuff all evolved, you know, they didn't like it. There's this kind of sort of deep sort of issue of heritage that I think affected some people's vote in the UK. And then I think there was, for some people, even a, an issue beyond that. And that was the trouble that, uh, that I've alluded to before, that being part of the EU customs union was holding the UK back. The center of gravity of global growth has moved to the Asia Pacific region in the world today. The UK knows that, yet it couldn't respond to that because it was, could only move as fast as the EU could move. And so the UK couldn't engage more with Asia because it couldn't negotiate a free trade agreement with China, for example, because only the EU could do that. And you think the EU, the EU's not even recognized China as a market economy yet. And yet it's meant to under WTO rules by the end of last year. I'm not sure what's happened there. Under WTO rules, the UK is meant to have, sorry, the EU is meant to have recognized China as a market economy. Yet the European Parliament voted against recognizing China as a market economy only last year. And so, you know, the, being part of that customs union, I think some people in the UK felt this is holding us back. We can't engage with where the action, the economic action is in the world today. So I think finally the package that David Cameron was able to negotiate with the EU was not going to be sufficient. It wasn't David Cameron's fault, I don't think. Uh, there's a limit to what the, the reform the EU could, could allow because some of these, so many issues are, are caught up in the treaties, the Maastricht Treaty and others that are so difficult to change. And so it was always my worry when David Cameron said, this is the best I can get from Brussels and put it to the people in the UK, that the amount of reform wasn't going to be sufficient to keep uh, the UK in the EU. So now that they're negotiating Brexit, to me, the huge issue is the extent to which politics and economic good sense uh, dominate 